for the minister's press briefing here at the Ministry of Information. Honorable Kojo Opon Kroma is the minister and also member of parliament for Ofwansia Irebi, and he will be leading us through today's briefing. But before I invite him to the podium, permit me to acknowledge our media partners and some dignitaries who have joined him this morning. If you are watching from the comfort of your homes or offices, we are live on GTV, Joy News, ABC News GH. We are also streaming on Facebook at Ministry of Information. This morning, we are joined by Dr. John Kisi, the acting director, Ghana Hydrological Authority. Dr. Kisi, if you are here. Also with us is the Deputy Managing Director Operations, TDC Company Limited, Mr. Samuel Asante. We have with us the Director, Department of Rural Housing, Mr. Sylvester Adonu. Also with us this morning is the Engineer-in-Chief, Public Works Department, Glory Nana Yanati. We are also joined by the project coordinator, Greater Accra Resilient and Integrated Development Project, Garid, Dr. Ohene Safo. Dr. Safo, if you are here, we acknowledge you. Also with us is the head, Real Estate Agency Council, Nana Otu Texan. We are joined this morning by the general manager, National Home Ownership Fund, Dela. Zumanu. Also with us this morning is the Chief Director at the Ministry of Works and Housing, Reverend Stephen Yawase. We have with us the Honorable Deputy Minister for Works and Housing and Member of Parliament for Kwesimintim Constituency, Dr. Prince Hamid Ama. And as I mentioned, my big brother is in the house. We have the Minister for Works and Housing and MP for the good people of Ofwase IRB constituency, Honorable Kojo Oponkroma. On that note, Honorable Minister, we will take your presentation and come back for the second part, which is the Q&A session. Thank you. Honorable Minister, thank you very much. Uh, Honorable Deputy Minister, Directors of um, the Ministries of Works and Housing and Information, and Heads of Agencies at the Ministry for Works and Housing, thank you all for uh, joining us this morning. Honorable Minister, thank you for the invitation to uh, be here to provide um, an update on development in the housing sector. Um, I recall when I used to invite other ministers to come and do this. Uh, and today, I am the one who is having to respond to that invitation. Uh, colleagues, I'm going to spend some time doing a very quick presentation on the developments in the housing sector. And then, like the Honorable Minister mentioned, after that, I'll take your uh, question. Uh, first is to give you a bit of a context of why housing is such a big deal not just here in Ghana, but all over the world. Uh, housing, as I'm sure you are aware, is not just um, a necessity. On the hierarchy of needs, it's one of the uh, basic needs of man. But in many respects, it is even a right. People have a right to decent accommodation wherever they are in the world. And decent housing provides security for people. It provides dignity for people. And then it also provides various opportunities uh, for people at the micro level. But on the national level, when you invest in housing or when you pay attention to housing, there are some benefits. Uh, at the macro level, it creates a lot of jobs for people. Whenever there's a housing project ongoing, you'll find scores of people uh, who are employed on it. Uh, quite recently, one of the housing projects that we did, um, the uh, Tesano Security Services Housing Project, we were informed that close to about 500 people were working on that project for the about three years that that project was under construction. And today, as uh, phase two of the police project around Adenta is ongoing, a lot of them, again, have been re-engaged there. 
So as a lot more housing projects go on, a lot of jobs are created in the economy. Also, when housing delivery is attended to, there's a lot of growth in the construction sector of the economy. Whenever you hear the Ghana Statistical Service say the economy has grown by X or by Y, when you go into the data, you'll find that construction is one of the elements, there are one of the subsectors of the Ghanaian economy. So when you're investing heavily in uh, housing, not only are you creating jobs, you are also stimulating growth in the construction subsector and by extension, growth in the broader Ghanaian economy. Um, when housing projects are also ongoing, you will find that communities are developing. So in the places where um, some decent housing projects have been put up, all of a sudden you find that that area becomes a developed area. Go to uh, Tema Community 22 where our NHF project is uh, ongoing. Go to um, Adenta or go to any of the places where you find housing projects. All of a sudden you find that development is taking place in that area. And then finally, when you pay attention to housing, you stimulate wealth creation for various categories of people. The individual who has bought that house now gets an asset class. He may have financed it with a mortgage or a loan, but very quickly he will have property worth 100,000 or 200,000 or 400,000. That helps him on the wealth creation ladder. He can then now take out value from that property and invest in another business or do other things. So you create wealth for individuals, for the companies that do the construction, the real estate companies, you are creating wealth for them. For the companies in the ancillary construction sector, those doing roads and sewage, etc., you are creating jobs for them. The banks that are financing it, they are also getting more money. So housing also delivers a lot of wealth creation, and that's why it's a big deal, not just in Ghana, but the world all over. Now, in Ghana's housing sector, there are a number of challenges that we are contending with, and I just want to highlight them before I get into the specific presentation of what we've been doing so far. One of the first challenges you'll find in Ghana's housing sector is the question of effective housing delivery programs. So in 2015, Ghana developed a housing policy. The policy spells out how we should go about delivering housing. But under that policy, you need specific programs that will help deliver the housing. One of the challenges that we've had in our republic over the years is that we've not had a lot of effective programs to deliver the housing. Sometimes we start, and then for various reasons, the project stall somewhere along the line. In fact, about 99% of the housing you find today is um, uh, delivered by the private sector on their own. So they'll find their land, they'll raise their money, and they'll build, and by, by, by all means, by the time they finish, the price will be through the roof. Or uh, people, you know, buy their own land and then take their time over five, ten years to finish putting up their building. So one of the first challenges is that unlike in other markets where you find a lot of programs to deliver housing in partnership with the private sector, we haven't had a lot of that in times past for various reasons. A second challenge is uh, the challenge of construction finance. If you need to put up a project, these projects are cost about $50 million, $100 million, etc., Getting the financing to deliver these projects on time is a big problem. How many real estate companies even can do these large-scale projects um, or can borrow? And how many banks can, on their own here in Ghana, finance some of these projects without having to syndicate or rely on other institutions? So construction finance has been uh, a challenge. A third challenge has been affordability. We all talk about affordable housing, but... The first part of the question is, how affordable is the affordable housing? By the time you buy your iron rods and cement and uh, concrete blocks, affordability begins to um, elude you. A fourth challenge is the infrastructure associated with housing. So roads, sewage, um, water, energy, communication, infrastructure becomes a challenge. There are many projects where you notice that they have even gone ahead to build a shell but you don't find the roads, you don't find the water or energy or other infrastructure. Saglem is an example. And the consequence is that by the time they are done, uh, it becomes difficult to move people into it. Challenge number five is that even if you are successful in delivering on it, who is going to buy and how are they going to finance it? Housing is not a product that you usually buy off the shelf, that they are selling a building for $80,000 a CD equivalent, and you have $80,000 to buy. Usually need financing. You take a loan or something. 
But in Ghana, we have a very shallow mortgage market. The market is very, very, very small. And so we are not able to get a lot of financing. And if we can't get a lot of financing on the demand side, the real estate companies will do 3, 4, 5, 10, 12, and you don't get the supply that you need. And finally, the regulatory environment. Who is enforcing the building code? Who is ensuring that those who are taking money from clients that we are going to build for you, uh, they're actually doing it? Um, architectural standards, engineering standards, who is enforcing all of those ones? So those are some of the challenges that Ghana's housing sector has been facing in times gone past. However, the good news is that in the last decade, between 2010 and 2021, we've been able to reduce our housing deficit by about 33%. We used to have a deficit of about 2.8 million units as at 2010. And in the last decade, we are now sitting at a deficit of about 1.8 um, within this period. It's been mostly delivered by private sector without any support from government. And what it means is that a lot of people are priced out at the end of the day. So what is delivered is still very high. And if you can't afford it, then you have to buy your own land somewhere outside the main cities and spend so many years in trying to put it together. And so um, at the Ministry of Works and Housing, we've been setting some priorities, focusing on which we believe will help us to bring the housing market into equilibrium, at least within the next decade. Over the last decade, we've done about 33% reduction. We're looking at bringing it into equilibrium within the next decade. To do that, we have agreed on some eight priorities that we are working with. And my presentation today will mostly focus on giving you an update on these eight priorities. Some of these priorities are about old things that we were doing already as a ministry, and some of them are new. So just want to quickly take you through them. First, our priority number one is to resolve the stalled housing projects. There were some projects that were started, work was ongoing, and for various reasons, they stalled. Priority number one is to resolve those ones. Priority number two is that for the ongoing affordable housing programs, you know, I mentioned that there are programs under the policy. One of the programs we have is affordable housing program. So for the ongoing affordable housing uh, program, which are some specific projects therein, we want to fast track them and bring them to a conclusion as quickly as possible. Priority number three is that we are focusing on initiatives to expand public sector housing. The single largest employer, the single largest employer in Ghana is the government of Ghana. And a lot of public servants have housing as one of their benefits. It's also important because it gives them a place to lay their head and therefore to be able to serve the republic better. But in years gone by, we haven't built a lot of new uh, public sector housing. And so our third priority is to focus on our initiatives that are aimed at expanding public sector housing. Number four, housing is put on land. So one of the things that we are prioritizing is to secure and expand our land banks at the ministry. Because we believe that A, it makes it easier for us to do our own housing projects, and B, where we have to do projects with the private sector, if we have land available to them, it cuts their hustle uh, by a significant percentage. But these four are mostly old items on our calendar, which we are prioritizing. And then there are a number of new items that we've put on our calendar since about February this year, um, when I met with the leadership of the ministry. Number one, which is number five on our list, is to develop a public-private partnership framework to close the housing deficit over the next decade. Remember I mentioned that we've done about 33% reduction in the last decade or so. But our population is growing, and urbanization is also increasing. So if we don't have an aggressive program to close the housing deficit, let's say in a decade then we could slip back. And so we've been developing a public-private partnership framework to close the housing deficit. And I'll give you some more details on where we are on that. Number six, it takes a lot of money to do these projects. If we always have to wait for the Minister of Finance to give us some money to you know, commence a project or to pay for a project, a lot of our projects will get stalled. No wonder some of the projects, um, some as far back as 10, 15 years, are still stalled. 
So we've had to be working on developing a sustainable financing framework for our housing projects. Number seven, we have uh, started work on a new district housing program, which is one of the programs under the housing policy. And this one focuses on ensuring that we don't just develop housing in the urban areas, but in the rural areas too, we do a lot of housing there. And finally, we are focusing on some legal and policy reforms. So, with your permission, I would like to get into some details and give you specifics on where we are. So let's start with resolving our stalled housing projects. We had about five stalled housing projects. Boteman, Asokore Mampong, Koforidua, uh, the state housing company's um, project in Adenta, as well as the Saglemi Affordable Housing Project. The good news is that Boteman and Asokore Mampong, we have already completed them, and now they are fully occupied. But we have three more of these five to complete, starting with uh, the Koforidua Affordable Housing Project. It was started during President Kufour's era, and it stalled since then. It comprises about 342 units of homes. So more or less about 342 families will get an opportunity to live there if we're able to finish this project. 19 blocks, 54 number one-bedroom apartments, and 288 number two-bedroom apartments. What we've done is to work with the state housing company for them to go through a process of identifying um, a private uh, contractor who can pre-finance the completion of the work. Uh, my understanding is that they've gone through the processes and they have awarded to a private contractor who can pre-finance the works. The contractor is mobilizing to move to site uh, so that work on those 342 units can be completed uh, for our brothers and sisters in and around Koforidua so that they can benefit from it. Uh, today, if you go to Koforidua, I think the new Eastern Regional Hospital is being constructed just around that enclave. And so this is a priority project that we are working to finish. And once we're able to finish it, doctors, nurses, and other uh, persons who live within that enclave can benefit from it. The next is the State Housing Companies Project in Adenta. This project was commenced in President Mills' era. It was suspended because of litigation in the era of uh, President Mahama. And the litigation went on for around 10 years. Earlier this year, we managed to get um, the court injunction lifted so that uh, construction could resume. And by the time we went back on site, there had been a lot of dilapidation. So they had to remove some of the old items, you know, parts of plumbing and electrical and other things had to be uh, removed uh, because of the integrity tests that were conducted. It comprises uh, four number one-bedroom apartments 36 number two bedroom apartments and 36 number three bedroom apartments, totaling about 76 units. So again, in this area, you have about 76 families that can live there once we finish with this project. Work is aggressively ongoing. We've been on site about uh, a couple of times, and the timeline to completion is December 2024. So we are working to finish that particular project. Number three, which I know many of you are interested in, is the Saglemi Affordable Housing Project. 1,506 units of housing um, partially completed. Some are uncompleted. Some were finished with some fittings in, in them. So 1,506 housing units out of 5,000 um, that was commissioned. Remember, the government of Ghana took a loan of $200 million to construct, well, construct 5,000 units of housing. And the average price at the time we were told was going to be about $40,000 when they were done. As at the time we assumed office, 1,506 units were partially completed, some at the foundation level, some at first floor level, some the shell had been built, some the shell had been completed with fittings in it. But the horizontal infrastructure uh, was missing. So you didn't have water, you didn't have sewage, you didn't have electricity. You had a road network within uh, the uh, enclave. Uh, we've been doing some work on completing that one. Cabinet in October 2022 gave approval for this project to be resolved after the initial investigations and the decision made that uh, the persons who had handled the project had some questions to answer in court because the $200 million was literally all paid out but only 1,506 partially completed. So it took some years to do the investigation and then the matter was sent to court. So October 2022, Cabinet approved 
for the resolution. Um, in April 2024, the technical working group had done some work, and so we issued the request for proposals to the private sector. Uh, by May, after about 10 or so companies had come to uh, inspect and had gone on site to receive the drawings, five of those firms brought in actual bids. Um, as at September, two companies have been shortlisted by our transaction advisors, and they have ferried the details of those two companies uh, to us. We've also received executive approval from the president on a structure to use for negotiations to get the best value for the Republic of Ghana. And indeed, last week, the negotiations um, commenced with an inception meeting. So you'll notice all the items we've already done are shaded in green, and the last two items are yellow. So negotiations are currently ongoing. We expect that uh, early November work will resume after um, a new developer is signed up to go onto the site. Now let me make a quick comment about these three projects we are resolving. You'll notice that we are working with the private sector to resolve these projects. A lot of the times people confuse us to say we are selling these projects. I want to repeat for the umpteenth time, we are not selling Saglemi, we are not selling Adenta, we are not selling Koforidia to the private sector. We have invited private sector to participate with their funding and uh, their technology. So they bring in the capital, we use their money and their technology to finish the project. And as was originally intended, these projects would then be sold to members of our worker unions, government workers, etc. And the funding that was brought uh, by the private sector is then received and paid back to the private sector. And whatever investment government also made in it, government recoups part of that investment. So. Uh, we reiterate that we are not selling these projects. We are working in a PPP framework to complete these projects. The fact that the government of Ghana does not have money in the treasury to advance to us to finish doesn't mean these projects should remain stalled. And so we're being innovative in raising private capital to finish these projects. In Saglemi, for example, we're told we needed about $100 million to finish it. $46 million or so of that is required for the outstanding infrastructure works, energy, infrastructure, sewage systems, and water. And then the remaining 60 or so um, to finish the uncompleted 1,506. Not to build the whole 5,000, but to finish the um, uncompleted 1,506. You need about 60 million or so. That's what the Ghana Institute of Surveyors uh, informed us. So, um, if we don't want to wait for government to make that money available and we don't want the projects to also continue dilapidating, then the best model is to work with the private sector to raise funding for it, and that's what we're doing. Priority number two is to fast track our ongoing affordable housing projects. And we've got three um, specific projects that we are working on. One through the National Home Ownership Fund, and then we've also got um, a specific project in Pokwase. You remember um, uh, ground was broken a little over a year ago. And then we've also got the Kung affordable housing project that is being done by the TDC. So let me give you the specific details. Let's start with the National Home Ownership Fund. The National Home Ownership Fund was established in 2018 as um, a client fund, as a master developer um, that gets some money from government and then leverages that to raise some more money and then they can do some housing projects. They started the NHF estates in Community 22 in Tema. And because of the model that they adopted, they've been very fast in developing those units. The first phase delivered 204 units. It was inaugurated by President Akufuado, I think, in 2020. The second phase, 201 units. Uh, that's also been uh, completed and they are now occupying. And from about April this year, we started work on the third phase, 129 units on the third phase. We started just this April. And if you go there today, we've gone past 65% completion of these 129 units. Some have been roofed, plastered, doors have been uh, fitted there. And it's particularly because of the kind of model that they are using. And I'll speak to that model as we move along, because we believe that that is the model that uh, we must use going forward. So if you go to the NHF estate in Tema Community 22, you'll find 500 and 34, am I correct, 534 units of homes that are there in the first three phases. 
and we are working with them to uh, also do some more. They are doing a few other projects in other parts of the country. We'll speak about that shortly. But under the um, affordable housing program that we are fast-tracking with them, this is one of the success stories. In Pokwasi, we are working on 8,000 units of homes. That is a different model. It's not the same like, um, uh, as the NHF model. So in the Pokwasi model, the government is supposed to build the horizontal infrastructure. That's roads, water, sewage, energy, and telecoms infrastructure. And then the private sector is supposed to use its own capital to build the vertical homes themselves. Um, currently, work is ongoing. Work is ongoing on the ground infrastructure. Uh, it's been advanced. Uh, um, um, the sewage system uh, is currently being built. They've got um, works on energy uh, ongoing. And then uh, they've also got works on the water system that they are, are working on. Once they are able to deliver a significant proportion of that, the private developers, uh, some of who have already started their work, can then be whipped in line to uh, run faster than they are doing with the vertical units because they are using their own money to build. As you know, no private developer will sink in so much capital if you haven't finished work on the um, horizontal infrastructure, else you could have the same scenario like uh, what you're having in uh, Saglemi. But government is moving um, at pace to get the ground infrastructure completed uh, so that the vesicle infrastructure, they can also move on it. Number three is the affordable housing project being executed by the Tema Development um, Company, TDC. They are doing a total of 1,904 units. Already they have done 1,072 units which have been sold to teachers, nurses, doctors, government workers mostly in Boom here in the greater Accra region. We look forward to commissioning these 1,072 units as quickly as possible. And I remember uh, uh, touring some of these units with you, our colleagues in the media, a few months ago. Just last week, we concluded work on financing and contracting for 832 new units in the Kung Enclave. We call that our phase four. So in the next about three weeks, work will commence on phase four. Uh, boom. That will bring it to 1,904 affordable units there. So under the umbrella of uh, fast-tracking our ongoing affordable housing projects, NHF is running quickly, 534 units. Pokwase, we are running with the ground infrastructure so that there can be some faster work on the vertical infrastructure. And then, boom, we've done phase one to three. We're just about starting work on phase four um, in the next about three weeks on the extra 832 units. A few uh, days ago or so, I think I saw some publications on it coming from uh, TDC. Priority number three is to provide some more housing for public sector workers. If you deal with our colleagues in the public sector, you would understand that a lot of them, like many of us, uh, go through a lot having to commute from various parts of the a capital to where we call the ministry's area to work. Um, there are many troubling stories of public servants who live sometimes as far back as parts of the eastern region and still have to come to work in the central business district to do some work. And so in the days of President Jerry John Rawlings, a program was approved to help deliver some more housing for the public sector workers, when it was found that government itself didn't have a lot of money. It was one of the problems I spoke about, to be building new units. They called it the Bangalore Redevelopment Program. What they do is that if you have a parcel of land on which there is, let's say, one of these old bungalows, you can enter into an agreement with the private sector where a private developer can redevelop that parcel of land. So they will pull down that one bungalow, sometimes build four, six, or eight Sometimes if they are building apartments, they can build 20 or 50 uh, units so that more public sector workers get accommodation where one person was living on half an acre or one acre. Currently at the Ministry of Works and Housing, for our 14 redevelopment projects that are live and ongoing, we are going to receive a total of 609 new homes for public sector workers, 609 new homes for public sector workers. Latebi Okoshi, Nkroma Flats area, Cantomens, Laboni, 
um, and many of those places, Roman Ridge and many of those places, you see a lot of redevelopment ongoing. Sometimes you hear the story that, oh, they say they've sold the bungalow, they've sold the bungalow. Under a redevelopment program, when a private developer comes in, what we do is that we contract them to redevelop at their cost to build 5, 10, 15, 4, 6, 8, depending on the number that the architects will uh, approve for us. And then in return, we yield a portion of the land to that private sector operator as his compensation. If government needs $10 million to build new bungalows for public sector workers and we don't have that money, this redevelopment program approved in the days of President Jerry John Rawlings and all the administrations since then have been on it goes through this process to deliver some more. So currently, we're doing 609 units for public sector workers. So my colleagues in the public sector, fingers crossed, um, I think from, from, from this month, we'll start giving out some of those uh, units. If you look at the work program, some of them are going to be handed over to us uh, this month. So please keep your fingers crossed. We've also got the security services housing program under um, the umbrella of delivering more public sector housing. Um, since 2017, President Akufuado's administration has delivered 1,000 homes to our security services under the public sector housing program. We initially did 368 homes uh, to the Navy at the Naval Command in Tema, and then we did phase one of the police housing uh, estate in Kwabinya. That was 312 homes. And then a few months ago, we did 320 units uh, to the Ghana Police Service in Tesano. Currently, we are working on phase two in Kwabinya, so we'll be adding some more to it. The military and other um, services have also brought in requests, and we are commencing some technical work to deal with the designs and the costing so that we can expand what has been done under the Security Services Housing Program. But... This is one of the significant things that has been done. 1,000 homes in the last seven years just for the security services. This is excluding the 1,000 by TDC, excluding the 534 by NHF, etc., etc. Um, and then finally, under our initiatives to expand public sector housing, we've got the Rental Assistance Scheme, the National Rental Assistance Scheme, which was introduced uh, by the Akufuado administration a couple of years ago. Now, what that scheme does is that it makes money available to prepay the rent advance for salaried workers so that they can service that payment on a month-by-month -month basis. Currently, we are operating, or we've divided the entire country into six operating regions uh, for purposes of um, coverage. And so far, 2,336 Ghanaians or Ghanaian families have benefited from this, 2,336 where their rents have been prepaid, and then they have been servicing it on a month-by-month -month basis. We've spent about 30.4 million Ghana cities um, in this program, and the money gets recycled because the beneficiaries paid back on a month-by-month -month basis, and then we're able to recycle that money. So it's not expenditure. It's actually an asset creation because it's an investment, and when they pay and they pay their interest on it, the float uh, grows beyond the uh, principal. We have a 100% recovery rate. That's the good news about this program. And what we are looking to do from 2025 as a government is to expand the coverage from the six operating regions now to break it down fully into the 16 geographic regions of the country and then also to increase the budget so that a lot more people beyond the 2,336 can benefit. So, colleagues, this is the update on our first three priorities. Priority number four is our land banks. As I mentioned earlier, all housing is built... Uh, on land. That's why the lawyers call it immovable property. Um, one of the things that is inimical to the housing sector in Ghana is our land tenure system. If you speak to the private developers, they will explain to you that one of the problems is acquiring land. Sometimes you buy the land and then you have to fight land guards and sometimes you have to pay three to four times to different um, you know, segments of the family before you can even get custody of the, the land to develop the project on it. Um, as a result, the government of Ghana, through the Ministry of Works and Housing, has acquired 51,000 acres of land across the country to ease 
the access to land question for developers. So for us as an administration, for us as a government, when we want to develop projects, we have about 51,000 acres of land at our disposal. We are also able to make part of this land available to the private sector if they will go into a partnership with us. So in Pokwasi, for example, the 203 acres that we are using is part of this 51,000 acres government land, and we have made it available to the private developers so that they don't have to buy the land or struggle to get title to the land. And they can therefore take away the land costs from their total costs so that the question of affordability, particularly on the supply side, we can go closer to that one. So we have taken steps to secure documentation to a great part of uh, our land assets. We are also physically moving to protect uh, some of these land parcels, especially places where we think there is a threat of encroachment. We are also engaging with the Alodia landowners, in particular for places where we haven't completed uh, paying the compensation, and we are commencing processes to pay the outstanding uh, compensations for those processes. But this is a big deal for us because it helps us to take away a major challenge in the housing sector, and we are keen, therefore, to ring fence our assets. Priority number five, which is one of the new things we are working on now, is to develop a PPP framework to close the housing deficit. Now, if you go to 2015, Ghana approved what we called a housing policy. And the housing policy in 2015 said that if we keep waiting for the private sector alone to find their own land, buy their own materials, and build, affordability will elude us. And so we should work between the public sector and the private sector to be able to deliver on affordable housing. Now, since then, a number of housing programs were developed. First is the Affordable Housing Program. And now we have added to the Affordable Housing Program a district's housing program. So now we are running about two programs. The Affordable Housing Program, which focuses on delivering affordable housing in the urban areas and the peri-urban areas. And then a district's housing program, which focuses on delivering what you call low-cost housing in the um, rural areas. Um, but we are clear that if we are going to get supply-side affordability to be successful, then government has to provide some incentives to the private sector so that it is worth their while to deliver at the price that we want. And so to get affordable housing, whether it's in the urban or peri-urban or rural areas, using whether the affordable housing program or the district housing profile, a set of incentives have been uh, agreed to, and I want to um, outline these incentives. We've divided them into two, supply-side incentives to ensure that we're able to get uh, affordability on the supply side and then demand-side incentives. So quickly, let me take you through the supply-side incentives. First is land, and I've explained that already. We've got in our custody about 51,000 acres of land, which we have taken steps to secure so that we can make it available as our equity uh, that we are making available to the private developer in the project. And the private developer, therefore, doesn't have to buy that land, and it will reduce the cost of the project. Number two is horizontal infrastructure. So we've learned lessons from Saglemi. As a government, we've learned lessons from Saglemi. We've learned lessons from Pukwase. We've learned lessons from Pung and um, what the NHF is doing. And so we are partnering with other ministries to deliver the horizontal infrastructure. What it means is that road, water, electricity, um, sewage, uh, uh, communication infrastructure, even we at the Ministry of Works and Housing no longer need to do it at our cost. Neither does the private developer need to do it at his or her cost. Working with the other ministries, we are prioritizing the budgets of those ministries for these areas where you have large-scale housing projects coming up so that they can deliver those. We're told that it sometimes uh, uh, costs about 30 to sometimes 50% the cost of the project just to do the horizontal infrastructure. And so if we're able to prioritize the budgets of the other ministries, departments, and agencies to deliver on these enclaves where large housing projects are coming, then we don't need to burden the private developer with that budget, neither does the Ministry of Works and Housing itself even need to uh, uh, spend it. It can be taken care of by our um, colleague ministries. And already we are piloting this. If you go to Amrahia, 
where the state housing company is building about 200 homes. We're already piloting this. So the road network is being done by the roads ministry. Energy ministry is handling uh, the um, connection of um, electricity there. It doesn't need to be the cost of the developer to bring in transformers, etc. Uh, and then the other horizontal infrastructure being brought in. So between the ministry uh, of works and housing and then the other ministries, we are working to reduce about 30 to 50 percent of the cost of these projects just by policy collaboration. Number three is to ease the regulatory compliance. So if you leave a developer on his own to comply with the regulations, sometimes the costs end up being a bit high. And the difficulties in going through the administrative processes end up being high. And so learning from Pokwasi, for example, between the Ministry of Works and Housing and the Assembly, uh, we're working to ease regulatory compliance by creating a one-stop shop at the Assembly to fast track all of the regulatory requirements and to ensure that um, the cash flow requirements are also reduced for the developer so that they can run faster. For those who are uh, um, adopting what we call appropriate technology, not necessarily using sancrete, but looking to use compressed earth uh, or other building technologies, um, we are looking to ensure that you get some fast track support from the rural housing department. So particularly for those who are going to do our district housing program, they have access to support from our rural housing uh, department so that they can move faster. We're also working through the National Home Ownership Fund and the unions, bringing on board off-takers for these projects. Why is that important? It's important because if you're able to demonstrate that you have off-takers at the conceptualization, financing is easier because then they can see where the payback is coming from. And so the NHF, that's why I said that in Tema Committee 22, they are using a different model the model they are using is that once they conceptualize a project and they advertise a project and then they line up off-takers, it is easier for them to get financing uh, from the banks, complementary to what government has made available to them. And therefore, they are able to move faster with these projects. And we are seeking to adopt the same model um, uh, under their leadership for the other projects. Tied to that is cheaper construction finance. So first is the National Home Ownership Fund itself. If you are coming into a PPP framework and you are going to be financed by a bank that is participating in our NHF financing program, then you are going to get between 40 and 45% discount on the interest of the financing, the construction financing, because of the blended finance approach that we are using. Uh, and we are growing that pot by working with GIF. I'll speak to it later. Uh, you'll notice that uh, uh, tax incentives are in red. So we have proposed tax incentives uh, to cabinet. But of course, because of our current economic situation, we don't have approval for the tax incentives. But we're keeping it on the table because we believe that moving forward, once our uh, financial situation improves as a country, we should be able to offer tax incentives in addition to these supply side incentives. Um, to master developers. If somebody is coming to build 10,000 homes, we should be able to say that on your machinery and your equipment that you are bringing in, we're going to waive taxes uh, on those. Because we are doing the same for the other person who is bringing in machinery for pharmaceutical and other products. And we believe that the housing uh, real estate developer who is doing master projects, uh, once our financial situation improves, also deserves some tax benefits. So today we don't have approval for that, but it's part of our incentives document and we'll continue fighting for it. Very quickly, on the demand side as well, we've got some um, incentives. First, to deepen the mortgage market. So we've been engaging with the banks and they've explained to us what they need to deepen the mortgage market. We have met the Bank of Ghana and the judicial service uh, that they have asked us to make representations uh, to on their behalf. And we are expecting that uh, that will translate into a deepening of the mortgage market uh, once the issues like regulatory forbearance um, is upheld by the central bank for them. Um, for the real estate companies that also want to do the rent-to-own schemes, we've got some incentives for them. I've already mentioned an expansion of the National Rent Assistance Scheme from the 2,300 beneficiaries uh, to a lot more people, and obviously that will help um, on the demand side. And then the Real Estate Agency Council has now been set up. And as part of their work, they will help uh, on uh, regulating the marketing so that there's real pipeline that developers can look to. Why is it important to deal with the demand side incentives, especially mortgages? 
because we don't want people struggling to pay the equivalent of $80,000 or $100,000 because then that is not affordable on the demand side. But if we deepen the mortgage market, you can still buy that same building spread over 20 or 25 years. In fact, with the model that we have piloted with the National Home Ownership Fund, Phase 1, it was a CD-denominated um, mortgage. And as a result, recovery has been 100%. Because it was a CD fixed, CD fixed interest rate, CD denominated fixed interest rate mortgage. And we want to be able to, working with the banks, uh, expand that so that all of us can benefit uh, from it. Priority number six, we're almost done, is to therefore answer the question, how do we have sustainable financing for housing? As I mentioned earlier today, about 99% of housing is delivered by the private sector. They go to banks or use their own money to build. And so um, construction finance itself now comes to add. If interest rates are around uh, 25 30%, then at least, at the barest minimum, even beyond the cost of the materials itself, you have another 25 to 30% of financing costs that you are paying. So how do we bring that down? We're bringing down the land question. We're bringing down the horizontal infrastructure question. How do we also solve the construction finance question? Now, I mentioned that the National Home Ownership Fund was set up in 2018. Very innovative financing. They get some money from the central government, and then they work with the banks by making that money available to the banks to leverage it to raise some more money with blended finance. That uh, interest rate, therefore, comes around. And that's why I'm saying that you get about 40 to 45% reduction in that interest rate if it is from a bank that is participating in our program. What we now want to do is to expand it for them to get some more money because there are years in which government budget is constrained and they may not necessarily get disbursements. And therefore, that limits how much um, financing they can create. And so working with the Ministry of Finance, and I want to thank Minister Amin and his technical team immensely for their cooperation with the Ministry of Works and Housing on this project. We have come up with a model to have the Ghana Infrastructure Investment Fund set up a sub-fund for housing. And I quickly want to explain to you how this model works. This model is supposed to support two types of projects. A, purely private projects. So if the private sector wants to deliver more housing on their own, they can tap into financing from this model. And then when government is doing its affordable housing project, we can also tap into it. Now, once a project is conceptualized, the project is put into what we call a deal book. That spells out the number of units, the housing, um, and client requirements, the pricing, schematics, everything. That deal book is then submitted to GIF. So GIF will now receive this deal book that says, we need $70 million or $50 million or $20 million for this particular project. As I'm speaking to you now, in Kumase, um, Otufo gave us about 200 acres of land, um, and we are very grateful uh, to Otunfo for, for that 200 acres of land for affordable housing. They are working on completing the deal book uh, to make available to GIF that this is the cost of that project. And then GIF will issue uh, an investor memo to the housing funds locally and globally. So you have pension funds that are interested. Recently you followed that Ghana went to um, Shelter Africa and got a seat on the Shelter Africa board and is trying to leverage that to raise some more money, a Frexin Bank and other places, you are then able to raise money into GIFT specific to that project. So the investor memo is then made available to the investors, and then they get funding into the GIFT housing sub-fund, but it's specific to that project. That blended project financing is then made available for that specific project. And when the project is completed, on the top side, you will find that the project is then sold to union workers and salaried workers, and that sale is backed by the financing from the banks, the mortgages, and hopefully we are looking to do the CD-based uh, mortgages. And the mortgages go back to pay into the fund the money that the investors put into it. So we don't have to wait for government every time to be struggling to find money for this, or for the banks themselves at very high interest rates to fund this. Um, so sales mortgages go back into the housing sub-fund, and then government will now pay into that sub-fund the component of the horizontal infrastructure. So if you are buying the property, you don't necessarily have to pay for the horizontal infrastructure. It is something that government ordinarily is doing, 
but this fund then pre-finances and then government over uh, an agreed period uh, finances it. And we think that this is one of the major innovations that will fast track the delivery of housing, both affordable and pure private projects, so that we can close this housing deficit um, in the next decade or so. Um, our final but one priority is a district housing program. Under the district housing program, we are doing two things. We've, we, are, we are starting the new district housing program, or what you call the low-cost housing in the districts. We piloted the technology with the construction of a piazza. So you recall that when the piazza uh, village was being reconstructed, the rural housing uh, department of the Ministry of Works and Housing worked uh, to deliver the technology, the compressed earth technology. Um, that is a technology, it's a very affordable technology that we are using for our district housing program. And um, we have concluded work and we have appointed the National Home Ownership Fund because of the excellence that they have demonstrated with TDC, etc., on Community 22, etc. We've appointed them as our client master developer. And so they are starting the district housing uh, program. We expect that it will help to deliver a lot of housing in the rural districts. We are trying to deal with rural urban migration. One of the ways to do that is to invest more in the um, you know, non-peri-urban or urban districts. If you go to the districts out there, one of the biggest problems is that teachers, policemen, nurses, doctors don't want to live there because housing is one of the problems. And so by focusing heavily on the district housing program while doing the affordable housing program, we're able to balance it out. Invest there, it creates more jobs, it develops, creates wealth and value there but it also provides accommodation for public sector workers who are in those areas. Under our district housing program also, we are resettling the flood victims from the Akosombo Dam disaster. So again, we're using the same technology for the resettlement and it's the same program that we are doing. We're working with the Ministry of Local Government and Rural Development to achieve that. You'll notice on the next slide that in April 2024, we broke ground to start work on the resettlement. I know sometimes people like to create a narrative that government is not doing anything about it. It's not true. In April 2024, I myself, together with my leaders, went on the ground uh, to break ground for construction to start. And many of you, our colleagues in the media, covered it. Um, alongside that, or parallel to that, we also had to do a validation of who really needed new housing. A lot of people came forward claiming that their buildings had been destroyed and therefore they needed new buildings. So we had to send the whole team, BNI, LUSPA, um, NADMO, to go there and do validation. So the validation exercise is done by, you come, you come and stand by your um, collapsed building or where it was. The local assembly member, unit committee members can all validate that it's true. This is where your house was. BNI and everybody, we are there. We're able to validate your Ghana card and then we're able to take when we finished this exercise, after about two and a half to three months, it took about two and a half to three months to finish, only 40% of those who were claiming that their buildings had been destroyed and needed replacement were true. Only 40%. In fact, it was 30, 38%. We then um, rounded it off to 40% to accommodate for those whose buildings were not destroyed but will need some support to you know, repair their old buildings. So we say 40%. Uh, of them were val validated. So we are in the process of building 2,225 new homes to resettle our colleagues who were affected by the floods. Now already, 115 units are under construction and they've gone past the 60% mark. Those are the units that I went to break ground for in April 2024. 115 of those units. We have also approved phase two of 1,010 units, and we've received the commencement certificate uh, for phase two. Currently, we're going through the PPA and uh, the land acquisition processes so that actual construction on the phase two can happen. And then we have made an application to cabinet because obviously 1,010 plus 115 is not equal to 2225. So there's a difference. We've made an application to cabinet to approve a program for us to finish the third phase as well. Uh, on the 15th, sorry, on the 5th of September 2024, which is eight days after I appeared before the uh, Assurances Committee of Parliament, remember we had mentioned that we'll be there in 14 days. Within eight days we were there, as you can see, 
um, to uh, the left side of my screen. Myself and the regional minister were there. We met with the consultants and the contractors and the entire technical team. We were then on ground to inspect the physical building units and where we even thought that uh, some more attention should be paid to the quality of work. I have written under my hand to the um, consultants to ensure that the contractors do a decent job there. So we're currently uh, beyond 60% on the first 115 units, and work is about to start on the second 1,010 units. Our final priority, legal and policy reform. So we are reviewing the Rent Act to ensure that uh, there is a better framework for assessing rent, and also, among other things, to ensure that hostels can be regulated, the operation of hostels can be regulated. When you go to many of our institutions and you see the kind of building that is being given out to students as hostels and the amounts that they are charging, it needs to be better regulated. And so as part of the New Rent Act, we are working on including a regulation of hostels uh, in the New Rent Act to bring a lot of relief and respite to our young brothers and sisters uh, on tertiary education campuses who have to rent hostels. We are also working on completing the latest round of the Ghana Housing Profile. That gives us the baseline data to show the gaps in the housing market, um, even grilled down to a district level, so that then when you are planning interventions, both for the private sector and the public sector, those interventions are guided uh, by data. And we have also started work on Ghana's first housing report to be put together by the Ministry of Works and Housing, which will, on a year-by-year -year basis, give the latest numbers on housing delivery both by the public sector and the private sector. I want to conclude, colleagues, by saying that we will continue to work with speed to achieve these eight uh, priorities because we are clear in our minds that housing is not just a right, it is a need, and it holds immense benefits for individuals and for the broader country if we succeed in delivering a lot more housing. I thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Honorable Minister, for the insightful presentation. You know, this podium is for Minister. You saw how comfortable he was, how he was flowing. But I was really, really, really impressed about the positive developments when he started uh, talking about the eight priorities. And among them is really the, the thousand homes delivered under the security services housing program. You wouldn't appreciate how impactful that program is unless you have a relative who is a police officer or a military man living in the barracks. In fact, um, when you see the condition that some of them live under, you would know that this was a very, very important project which should have been executed decades ago, not now. But I'm happy that uh, we are catching up and all these uh, beautiful homes are being delivered to the security services. Honorable Minister, another one is the 1,904 housing units completed by TDC. We always talk about decongesting Accra, decongest Accra, but we forget that we have a city ride across <laughs> The, the highway or the motorway. And this project and the rate at which they have executed it will give um, relief to a lot of public servants. People can stay in Tema and come to work downtown rather than everybody uh, looking for a place to rent within Accra. And also, as you eloquently uh, mentioned, uh, Honorable Minister, the district housing program, I believe it's... it's it's, it's one of the most impactful uh, projects that have been uh, designed by the ministry because so many people refuse posting to rural Ghana because of housing. And even if you don't live in a rural area, when you have a funeral or any activity that sends you to some of the re districts, I remember there was a time I joined a delegation to one of the districts in Oti region. And we struggled. The whole day, even hotel, we couldn't... Hotel as in hotel that will meet like a 300 Ghana city uh, budget hotel in Accra, we couldn't find. So the challenge in some part of the country are real, and I'm excited that Honorable Minister and his 
uh, team are resolving it. And for the youth and urban dwellers, there is no better news than the uh, rent assistance scheme <laughs> because to find two years rent advance or even a year's rent advance is not easy. And I'm excited that the project has actually taken off and over 2,000 Ghanaians have benefited. So on that note, Minister, I'm advocating for you that they should give you more money. They should put in more money so that uh, that scheme can cover a lot more beneficiaries, especially in Accra. Honorable Minister, on that note, uh, we'll take questions from the audience. Ladies and gentlemen, if you have any questions, this is the best time to ask. Kindly show by hand. David will bring the microphone to you, and then you can ask your question. Nana. Good morning, Honorable Minister. Welcome back home. Um, I have three short questions for you. In some jurisdictions, my name is Nana Poku from Daily Searchlight, sorry. In some jurisdictions, when you finish school and you start work, you are given what they call council flats in the UK so that you work and pay by mortgage. By the time when you go to retirement, you have house, your house already. But here in Ghana, you live in Govan Bangalore, when you retire, you have to pack your bag and baggage and leave. And sometimes, if you are not lucky to put up your own house, uh, God knows what is going to happen to you. I don't know if you have a scheme for that so that people, because most of the corruption going in the public sectors and civil service is because of where a man must lay his head. And therefore, people will do all kinds of things to get their houses so that they can retire comfortably and uh, stay in their houses. My second question, uh, can you please indicate or highlight on where the 55,000 acres of land are located in the country so that maybe private uh, developers can access them and then help in the housing scheme? And Thank them? you. Nana, two questions, I, I beg you. So that your colleagues will also get the opportunity. I've seen John's hands, uh, John, and I've also seen a few hands at the back, so please. But if there is a chance, I'll come back to you for you to ask your last question. All okay. right. Thank you. My name is John Awuni. I represent Kesben TV. Uh, Minister, um, how will the ministry ensure that the housing development are affordable to low middle income families, given that about 80 percent of working population engages in informal economic activities. And also, you mentioned the private participation in this area. Uh, what are the incentives that will encourage more private participation in the housing sector so that at least they can benefit for whatever investment they, they get in to help uh, eradicate the problems of housing? Thank you. Thank you for the question. Yes. Um, good morning. My name is Salom from the News Center. I've got a question on the Akusombo resettling. I do not believe we got specific timelines for which, by which uh, the victims would be settled. So could you provide that information? How soon can we expect to see the victims of the Akusombo flooding being resettled? Thank you. Thank you for the question, Salom. Are there any hands? Okay. If not, I take that to be the last one. Then, Nana, please, you can ask your third question so that we can invite Honorable Minister for his responses. Thank you, Honorable Minister. My last question has to do with, um, we sort of uh, name some houses affordable, but God knows whether they are very affordable or not. Because in the end, we get people who are well-to-do to buy the houses and rent them to the same poor people. And so I don't know how affordable it is. Um, so what can be done? Because um, uh, when you finish the housing projects, like I'm saying, people who can afford it, because the, the, the asset developer wants his money back, and therefore the same rich people go and buy the houses and rent the houses back to the poor people. What is being done about this situation? Thank you. Thank you for the questions. Honorable Minister. Dean, <laughs> thank you for your questions. Um, so, yes, you're right. In parts of the world where there's a strong 
uh, program to supply housing. Remember I mentioned that one of our first challenges is that we haven't had a lot of effective programs to supply housing. Uh, and in other parts of the world, there have been very strong programs over decades to supply housing. They've done it so well that now even at their borough or council level, the boroughs or councils can find funding to supply housing, even including social housing. And that's what they were using for the council flat um, you know, model that they were running. Um, the answer to that is that we also now need to grow effective housing delivery programs. That's the first step. And those programs have to be backed by financing and also by incentives so that we'll be able to deliver a lot of affordable housing all over the country and even venture into social housing. Currently, for social housing, the only pilot we have is what His Excellency the Vice President has led us to do for the Kaya, where people can come in, maybe rest for a period, you wake up, you take a shower, you go. So it's like dormitory type. You come, you take a shower, you go out there, and then you go uh, to find your daily bread, and then you can come and rest somewhere. We haven't even gone uh, into a full social housing program in this country. But the answer is to now have effective, uh, affordable housing delivery programs, back it with the funding, and to deliver a lot more. It is when you have this supply that you can now begin to get to the levels you are talking about. And that's exactly what we are doing with the priorities that we have set and the work within these priorities that we are talking about. Your question number two, where is our 55,000 acres? First, it's all over the country. In uh, mostly all the uh, 16 regions, we have different parcels of land. Second is that we um, currently at the ministry are going through a project to uh, digitize the assets of the ministry, all our bungalows and all our land, to put them on a digital repository. So that, for example, even when government workers are looking for bungalows, they don't have to come and see the minister. You can go online and then you will find and then you'll be able to apply. As part of that digitization project, the full itinerary or the full list of where our lands are situated will also be made available. So that private sector players that want to come, even with their own packaged deal books, as I mentioned, can decide that I want to do mine in OT or I want to do mine in Western North because I've seen that government has these lands that they are making available to private sector for partnership. So um, once we get approval from the PPA to procure the digital database to put all of these out there to be available for the public, in the meantime, private developers are welcome to um, make any requisition and we will respond uh, accordingly. After all, we have the RTI Act, so if they ask, we'll make information um, available. We also want to discourage the old practice where even when you have affordable housing, the same rich people buy it in block and then end up selling or renting it out to the middle or the lower classes. And that is why um, using the National Home Ownership Fund model, they deal with the unions in particular and salaried workers. And when you are making an application, that application is backed by some data. You have a national ID card, um, your um, employers are known, your salary is known, the bank that is underwriting uh, the purchase for you is known. So it becomes easier for them to uh, weed out people who want to buy these projects in bulk and then sell or rent it out. Indeed, let me save notice that when we are done with Saglemi, our priority is to sell to government workers, um, teachers, nurses, physician assistants, doctors, military, police, fire, and other salaried workers who can get a financing mortgage from their bank and then uh, pay. We don't want to get into the situation where the same rich people come buy it in bulk and then they start um, you know, either renting or selling it out. And that's a model that the NHF has already piloted in Committee 22. And that's why we are saying that for some of our major developments, we have appointed them um, to be our client master developer in that area. There was a question about affordability from, I think, the new center. Affordability, as I mentioned, is a two-sided coin. There's supply-side affordability, and then there's demand-side affordability. The two must come together to make the property affordable to you. So on the supply side affordability, I've already explained to you what we are doing about land, what we are doing about the horizontal infrastructure, what we are doing about the other incentives that we can give to ensure that at the end of the day, the building is not costing you an arm and a leg. Uh, for those who bought properties in the private estates some 10, 15 years ago, 
you pay for drainage and road and everything else, and the land and everything else associated with this. Now, under our new model, if we're able to make land available to you so you're not paying for it, do the horizontal infrastructure, you're not paying for it, take away about 40 to 45% of the interest on construction finance because of NHF and GIF, then we are bringing supply-side affordability to a real affordable level. But even beyond that, on the demand side, we believe that housing is not something that we should encourage people to look to uh, find $50,000, $80,000 city equivalent to buy and block, as is the practice today. <clears throat> and to achieve that, that's why we're working with the banks to ensure that they can also then uh, now use their core deposits to underwrite a lot of um, CD mortgages, like we've already piloted with the National Home Ownership Fund. I mentioned earlier that to achieve that, they asked us to engage the Bank of Ghana and the Judicial Service on their behalf, which we have done, and we are hopeful that it will translate into the results that we uh, are expecting. The coverage ratio is about 30%. Um, so for the mortgage side, um, you should be a salaried worker, where about 30% of your salary should be able to cover uh, the monthly repayment for the particular mortgage. If you are not a salaried worker and you are a business person, let's say a private business person, your business record should be able to demonstrate to your bank that um, at least about 30% of your profit, 30% of your profit, whether it's on a monthly basis uh, or so, can cover um, your mortgage. So the coverage ratio hovering around 30%, you must be able to demonstrate to the financial institution so that they can cover uh, for you. Um, how soon to settle the Akosombo flood victims? As I mentioned, we've started work on phase one. Phase one, we expect that by the end of November, that's a timeline that the consultant and the contractors have given us. They tell us that by the end of November, they should be done. That's a timeline the contractors and the consultants have given us for phase one. Phase two, as I mentioned, we are going through the processes to commence work on phase two. So when we are commencing, we'll be able to announce a timeline for the conclusion of phase two. And phase three, I've mentioned to you that we are before cabinet uh, asking for funding and approval so that we can start that one as well. At the time that they are starting that one, we'll be able to give a timeline uh, for the conclusion of that phase as well. What we have now is phase one, and the timeline that they've given us is the end of November. Thank you. Thank you so much, Honorable Minister. Ladies and gentlemen, if there are any questions, we can take a final round. If not, we will take Honorable Minister's concluding remarks. Okay. I've seen a hand. Mr. Tamensa. Yeah. Thank you. Atamensa from Jenny. Yes, regarding the Akosombo village, then the concession of uh, housing units for them. Uh, as you rightly said, after validation, about 40% came out that they had their burden destroyed. And in total, you said about 2,225, but you have started with 115. I want to find out, does it mean the number of people who had their property destroyed are 2,225? I want to find out if you can clarify for me. And then how much is government intend to uh, spend in completing this total housing for the victims? And then my second question is with regard to uh, code, regulation of code in the housing sector. In recent times, you have observed a full house after some time it collapsed. Recently, we experienced them in uh, Kasua where a, a building collapsed and four people died. You have experienced these things over the years. What measures are you taking in place to enforce the regulation, to ensure that uh, proper things are done to avoid these uh, disasters? Thank you for the questions. Yes, please go ahead. All right, thank you for the open opportunity. My name is Eko Saki with Metro Television. The Honorable Minister mentioned that 609 new homes will be given to public workers this month. For, for the sake of clarity, I want to find out if this September or November, because today is 30th. Okay, thank you for the question. Are there any hands? Okay, Honorable Minister, I take that to be the last question. 
So we'll take your responses and also your concluding remarks. So, Honorable Minister, thank you. Um, I always say that words have meanings. So we have to pay particular attention to the words that we speak. 2,225 homes. That's the number of homes that were totally destroyed. It doesn't mean that 2,225 people were affected. You have a home in which sometimes you have three people living or two people um, living. So 2,225 homes were totally destroyed, not even just affected, totally destroyed and therefore require replacement. So 2,225 homes were totally destroyed and those are the ones that we are replacing. That is 40% of the number of claims that came in and that is what was validated. Uh, we're expecting the government will spend between four and 500 million Ghana CDs to complete um, the entire resettlement exercise. Now, let me explain something else. When it comes to resettlement, it's not just building a home for somebody whose home is totally destroyed. It also comes with putting in place other items that enable them to resume their livelihood. So you have an area where children had a school, there was a health center that they used to participate in. Now, when you are resettling them, it means that where you are building, you must be able to answer questions of education and health, etc. So there are costs associated with the core homes themselves, and then there are ancillary costs that will come with the other uh, things that are required for resettlement, if you want to resettle these people. But we're looking between 400 and 500 million Ghana cities to complete this resettlement exercise. Already we have been given commencement certificate to commit government to 200 million. And I think it's very important because sometimes these things get misreported. You hear somebody say that, they say they've given them 200 million. No, they've not given us 200 million. We have been given commencement to commit government to the tune of 200 million, and that government will pay. And so that is the one that we have started with 1,010, um, and then the first 115. We are before government asking for further commencement approval so that we can finish the residual units. And it's important that we explain it well uh, for the public to understand. I very much love the question of the building code that you raised. It's very dear to my heart. I had a very traumatic experience in my childhood days um, about a worker I knew who fell from a building and died. And you know how those things can have a you know, lasting, uh, traumatizing effect on you. So when I got to the ministry, one of the first things we were asking was about this building code and health and safety at work sites. Um, I mean, like you know, all of us, after school, you do some ala ala to you know, get some small money. After school, I had the opportunity to work on a construction site as a laborer in the United Kingdom briefly. And if you don't have your PP, you will not be allowed onto the work site. It doesn't matter who the supervisor is. Even if he's a Ghanaian and you're a Ghanaian and he's your friend, he won't let you get on because there's a works inspectorate unit that will inspect that everybody on the construction site is properly clothed. Putting these things together, one of the first things we did was to set up a works inspectorate unit at, uh, under the works department at the ministry. We did it in, I think, about um, August or so, right after I assumed. And we've assigned and appointed people whose job it is now to go around public work sites and ensure that there's compliance to the building code, to the regulations of the engineering council, the architect's registration council, um, and even the local assembly. In fact, I led some of those visits to parts of the eastern region where right before us we saw construction workers who were using tangos and other machines and were not even wearing uh, hard boots or hard hats. And so um, we have started some work on it by putting in place a works inspectorate unit. One of the things that we've also assigned the works inspectorate unit to do is to check for all public buildings that are not complying with the Disability Act. Ghana passed the Disability Act that requires that disability access is provided in all public buildings for persons who are disabled. But there are many of our public buildings that still, even after the 10-year moratorium, are not complying. Many of our ministries, departments, and agencies, and public buildings are not complying. So the other mandate of the Works Inspectorate Unit is to go out there and check. And there are penalties in the Disability Act. You can be fined by the courts 
if you uh, are an owner occupier of a public building and you don't comply with the Disability Act. So working with the Attorney General's department, what we've agreed is that when the reports come from our Works Inspectorate unit, we'll forward it to the AG's department for them to prosecute um, owner occupiers of public buildings who are not complying so that um, you pay the fine, I think it's of about 6,000 CDs or so, um, in, in, in accordance with the penalty unit. We never know when any of us will be disabled. President Kufo told us that when he was passing the Disability Act, he never imagined that he himself would someday sit in a wheelchair. So it's something that we today who are abled and walking on all tools must pay attention to. And that, in addition to health and safety at work sites, forms part of the mandate of the newly established Works Inspectorate Unit uh, under the Works Department of the Ministry of Works and Houses. And I'm very happy that you asked this question. It's something that we are keen on. Again, words matter. I did not say that we will be um, giving out 609 new homes to public servants this month. I didn't say that. I said we've got 609 new homes under construction for public servants. And that from October, we will start receiving some of those units and handing the ones we receive over to um, the public servants who have already made applications uh, and are on the list. So again, 609 homes under construction for public servants. From October, we'll start receiving some of those units and we'll make them available. Colleagues, I want to conclude by saying that um, the importance of the housing sector is not lost on us. If you look at what they did, I think, in America after the Great Depression, I think it was uh, Roosevelt, where, where, where they introduced what they called the New Deal. One of the major pillars was to invest heavily in construction. Because when you invest heavily in construction, you are creating jobs, you are growing the economy, you are developing new areas, you are creating wealth for a whole value chain of people. And if you do housing specifically, then it also then provides for people's basic needs, sense of dignity uh, for people. And so we are keen, the Akufuado administration is keen on continuing with its housing programs and expanding them so that all of us will benefit at the end of the day. Honorable Minister, I want to thank you and your team for hosting us here. Oh, a bigger round of applause for Honorable Minister. <laughs> Honorable Minister, Honorable Deputy Minister, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for attending upon invitation. This is an eye-opener, Honorable Minister. I believe because of social media, the commissioning of the security services housing programs, we've seen that of Kwabenya and Tesano, but taking us through your entire presentation, uh, I believe people will appreciate that we've done a lot more than what have uh, been published or what have been shared in the social media space. So thank you so much for the good work that you are doing at the ministry. And we hope that you will come back some other time for us to have some specific conversations. There is so much happening at the place. So maybe we need to tease them out and take them one after the other, Honorable Minister. So thank you and enjoy the rest of your day.